So yeah, we're going to talk about soil organic carbon with, uh, uh, and soil basics with Warren Dick here. Uh, uh, and then we're also going to bring in Dave Brandt. Uh, obviously, a lot of you or all of you know Dave Brandt, 40 plus year, no tiller in Fairfield County. Uh, Dave also wants to start because he, he, he heard something during the presentation and he wants to kind of put uh, uh, correct things a little bit. So I'm going to let him take it and then Warren's going to take over for his presentation. So thank you both for being here this morning. Thank you. Well, Aaron said there's no silver bullet. I really think there is. I think if we learn to infiltrate, that's really going to help us. And it's a proven fact that if we could cover the soil year round, that soils are warmer, cooler in the summer by 20 degrees, you know. So I think there's some really good answers. You know, just imagine if every acre in Ohio was covered during the summer and it was 20 degrees cooler, that means the biological effect of the soils are much better, so yields increase and you infiltrate the water. Why we're having a problem is we have so much non-infiltrating soils that it runs off. About 80% of the soils in Ohio can only handle a quarter inch of rainfall in an event, you know, because the rest of it runs off. So the silver bullet would be looking for cover crops, lowering the temperature of the soils during the summer, and I think that would make us more climate smart, would be my comment for the silver bullet. Warren, go right ahead. Uh, can you change to the other presentation? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Dave and I are going to do a tag team here. I'm going to start. You have a question back there? I just want to make a comment. That's a really good picture to see your farm all green and all the neighbors are killed. That's, that's a really nice picture. Thank you. Yeah, so Dave and I are going to tag team. I'm going to start. Actually, my title is developing and maintaining soil organic carbon and or organic matter, they're basically the same. That's kind of the title they gave me. Another title I have is Farming Smart is Climate Smart. <laughs> so, uh, but I'm gonna talk basically about basic soils and uh, kind of maybe stretch uh, what I'm gonna talk about normally when I talk about soils from statewide or local all the way to international and um, so I am retired, but uh, Randall Reeder, uh, you know, this is March Madness, right? And uh, everybody's talking basketball, and so they brought me off the bench for this week. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, I worked at Ohio State for almost 40 years, and I've seen a lot of students come and go through the years, and Ohio State students are really smart. I'm sure other students are too, but, you know, I, I don't know if this is a true story, but I heard it heard it anyhow. You know, some of these large classes we have at Ohio State, you know, introductory math or chemistry or whatever, 100 plus students. Well, this one prof, he was teaching his class and it came to exam time and he gave the exam and he says, now this is the rules. When the bell rings, you have to turn in your exam. You know, you just, that's it. That's done. So he handed out the papers. And the students start writing away, just going away, and the bell rang. Everybody got up but this one student. He just kept writing. Five minutes later, he had five minutes extra than everybody else. Finally, the prof went up to him. He said, remember the rules when the bell rings? You're supposed to turn in your exam. He says, well, just give me a minute. I'm, I'm almost done. He kept writing and waited a few more minutes. And the prof said, you got to turn it in right now, son. Time is up. And the student says, you know who I am? It doesn't matter who you are. The time is up. You have to turn your exam. And the student said a second time, do you really know who I am? And again, the prof said, it doesn't matter. The time is up. Turn in your exam. And the third time, the student said, do you really know who I am? And the prof said, even if you're the son or daughter of the president of Ohio State University, you're going to get a zero. And the student said, well, since you don't know who I am, he got up, walked to the desk in the front, put his exam in the middle of this whole pile of papers, shuffled the papers, and walked out. <laughs> All right, let's get serious. You know, this, this is a, a quote I just got, March 1st, 2023, a no-tiller from Brazil. Uh, in the No-Till Insider Daily email. He said, if scientists in the multinational companies that produce agricultural products can help, they can help farmers measure their carbon inputs and outputs, 
with the goal of achieving a balance, it's quite possible to reach carbon zero agriculture. And you know, the saying is you can't manage what you can't, if you can't measure it. And so he's saying if we had some tools to help us manage our carbon input and outputs, farmers could do a great job to get to zero carbon neutral uh, farming agriculture. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about carbon and soils. Oops, wrong way. So uh, defining agriculture, I I'm gonna start here. I got this slide from my chairman quite a number of years ago. It doesn't matter if you're in Ohio or in Ethiopia where I have a NUN project. What farmers do basically at a very basic level is manage their systems to optimize the photosynthetic capture of the sun to make a crop, to make a product. That's really the most basic level of agriculture. And so everything that's done, the crops, you, uh, the varieties you choose, the fertilizers, the row spacing, the weed control, all that is to maximize photosynthetic capture in your crop. And of course, that's all about carbon, right? And farmers are integrators. I think probably some of you have heard uh, Jerry Hatfield make this comment. Farming is not rocket science. It's more complicated. It's true. Farming has so many variables involved uh, that we have to manage. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the basic of soil, the basics of soil. So some of this is going to be old for you. Some of this may be a little bit new or, or uh, reminders of what you have known in the past. Some of it might be brand new, but we'll see. But anyhow, Leonardo da Vinci, way back several hundred years ago, made this quotation. He says, we know more about the stars high above our heads than about the earth just below our feet. Soil is one of the most complicated things you can find on this planet. Wendell Berry, the great uh, poet, agricultural poet, said, the soil is the great connector of lives, the source and destination of all. It is the healer and restorer and resurrector by which diseases pass into health, age into youth, death into life, Without proper care for it, we can have no community because without proper care for it, we can have no life. The importance of soil, and Aaron set me up really well for this talk. He did an excellent job of introduction. So what is soil? Again, very basic. It's the unconsolidated material on the surface of the earth. I've uh, seen a demonstration of a person at the National Soil Science meetings, he took an apple, he would peel the apple, he said the peel is what we manage. All the rest of that apple is the core of stuff that we really can't do much about, but we can manage that peel, that unconsolidated area. And it's the surface of the earth that has been subject by soil forming factors. What are those soil forming factors? How does our soil change? What, are, what causes it to form? So the soil forming factors are climate. We talked a lot about climate already this morning. Your soils change or are different in Arkansas than Ohio, although they might change <laughs> to be the same, I don't know. Uh, the macro and microorganisms, your earthworms, your bacteria, your fungi, your topography, where you're on the landscape, on the top of a hill or down at the bottom of, in a swale. The time, soils develop over time. If you take a, make a management change, that doesn't reflect immediately. It takes a little bit of time to see that change. And then parent material, and that's something you can't really do much about. Uh, you know, whether you develop your soil in a sand or alluvial material or a bog in organic soil. And soils, like people, come in all different types. And you can see different soil profiles. 
So soil is one of the most complex natural materials found in nature. This is just a rough rule of thumb, but roughly half of a, of a soil is mineral or solid material, half is pore space. And uh, you don't want all your pore space filled with water. That's a waterlogged soil, that's not healthy. And you don't want it all filled with just air because you need water to support plant growth. Mineral material is very important. Uh, many of your nutrients come from the mineral, but also organic material, roughly 5%. That's, again, just a rule of thumb. That's where all your organic carbon, uh, your bacteria, your macro and, and microinvertebrates, all that's in that 5%. So what is a healthy soil? Soil health also called soil quality, and its measurement has to be defined within the context of its use. So in this audience today, we define soil health by how it can help produce crops and uh, purify the water and, and those sorts of things. A civil engineer defines soil, a, a high quality soil, very differently. They look at soil strength and how much pr load a soil can bear, that sort of thing. So you have to define soil quality based on its intended use. I'm going to talk about soil quality within an agricultural context. And soil quality is made up of the physical properties, the chemical properties, and the biological properties. And it's where all three of those intersect is where we say we have good soil quality. And I'm going to go in some of these in a little more detail right now. So what is a healthy soil? The chemistry talks about the parent material, soil pH, nutrients. We want to manage that properly. The physics are the energy, the processes of water, soil structure. And the biology has to do with the small animals, the microorganisms, plants, plant roots. And we want to integrate those to come up with a good soil quality. Okay, so soil organic matter. It's like equivalent to your bank account, in a sense. Your stabilized organic matter, or your humus material, makes up about 50%, 30 to 5 to 50% of the organic matter or carbon in soil. That's very stable. It's what makes the soil black, generally. It doesn't turn over very quickly. So it's, it's like your retirement account. You just let it build over time. And maybe down the road you do draw on it little by little, but it doesn't change. Then you have your savings account. That's your decomposing organic matter. That's your active fraction. That's where you, you get into it periodically. More often, you know, you... You need to build an extension on your house or buy a newer car or something. You go get into your savings account. So there are times when you might need to uh, draw down some of your nutrients. And so that's your savings account. Your checking account is your fresh residue, your newly deposited material that you deposit into your bank account. It's deposited there. It turns over re readily, uh, quite rapidly, and uh, so that's your, your uh, checking account. And your bank tellers are your organisms. They're the ones that transfer everything for you from the living, I mean, from the decomposing fresh residue or organic matter or stabilized organic material. They're the ones that do the transfers. So those are the bank tellers. And I, I just like this. It gives a, a kind of a good way to think about soils and the different carbon fractions in soils. Oops, wrong way again. So soil biology, this has really been my expertise over my career. A teaspoon of soil, and you probably have seen some of these numbers before, has about 1 to 500 million bacteria, 1 to 20 million actinomycetes, Fungi, 5,000 to a million. Uh, yeast, 1, 100, 1 to 100,000. Protozoa, 1 to 500,000. Algae, 1 to 500,000. Nematodes, 1 to 100. 
those are, you know, those ranges, those are ranges. In addition, there are a large number of microbial viruses, slime molds, insects, and earthworms. The viruses are literally way more even than the bacteria, because some bacteria can have three or four different viruses in them. And they can really impact the biology of your soil. And, and there's been very little research on viruses in soil. Very little. They're, they're starting to look at it. Uh, so when we talk about soil quality, we do talk about uh, soil aggregation and carbon is very important as part of that because uh, what holds the particles together generally is organic matter. So when you build organic matter by less tillage, you also build a better structure, better aggregation of the soil. And you can see conventional tillage versus reduced tillage. Uh, and as you build or your organic matter in soils, actually the value of your cropland goes up. There's been a study from Illinois showing uh, the yield uh, per acre uh, goes up as your organic matter goes up. And that makes your, your crop, your soil, your land more valuable. Now this is going to be a little bit new. I, I've never really given this talk to a group like this before, but I thought it'd be interesting to this group. Soils and Human Health. There's a whole book written about, literally, I think there's a couple hundred different diseases that are impacted by the soil, human diseases that are impacted by the soil. I'm gonna just give you a few examples, but this whole book has been written, Soils and Human Health. Very interesting, different book. So, protozoa, types of organism soil that cause human health disease, Protozoa, parasitic worms, nematodes. Uh, if you don't have good soil, you don't filter out these things. You have poor quality water. People drink that to get tapeworms, especially in some of these developing countries. Uh, it doesn't show. I don't think. This, this is this is a foot. Scale, so you can see that's a pretty long, healthy tapeworm. <laughs> and many places in the world where they have poor soil quality, this, these are issues that they face. This is another one. This is I work in Ethiopia and Africa, and I'm going to uh, give a little bit of overview of that work at the end. But they had a disease which kind of looks like elephantiasis, these very enlarged legs. And they couldn't figure out what was causing it. And they did all kinds of studies, but a missionary doctor, Ernest Price, was the one that solved it. And what was, I should ask, anybody have any guess what was causing it? I, I won't, I'll, I'll just give it away. So. In Ethiopia, they have a lot of volcanic soils, which are very glass-like. And they would go running around barefoot. And these little glassy particles would go through the skin of the feet into the lymph system, clog the lymph system so you couldn't circulate the, that lymph material, lymph fluid. And it would accumulate in the, in the legs and the feet, causing this problem. So you know how he solved it? He started asking everybody to wear sandals, just from simple sandals made from old tires, thongs, and people started wearing the sandals and the disease went away. Soil has many, many impacts. These are probably more dramatic. Medicines from soil, kaopectate, if you ever have diarrhea, what is kaopectic? It's just clay. And, uh, Eating soil can correct many nutritional balances. I always have told people, don't be, don't be so concerned about your kids eating dirt. It's healthy when your kids eat dirt. It really, really is. It helps their immunity system and balance some minerals and other things. Uh, even birds know that. They, you know, this is an example of a bird. Birds will eat soils to help their crop, you know, to digest, but also for the mineral. And they're very picky about what types of soils they eat.
Healthy soils are the basis for healthy food. If you have a healthy soil, your, your food, your crops that you produce are gonna be more nutritious. So for example, uh, potatoes are good sources of uh, potassium. And so if you have a good quality soil, your potatoes will be high in potassium and that's very healthy for the heart. Uh, plants grown in soil with sufficient nutrients are called nutrient dense. So this is an example of, of a leafy types of vegetables and roots. Now, one of the problems has been as we moved across the continent and began to uh, do agriculture on this, the prairies and even the forest soils, we really decreased the organic matter content, organic carbon content by about 50% or more. I have just seen just the other day, it was again, I think a no-till farmer put out a, a study, a little graph that showed we're starting to reverse that just slightly because of conservation tillage and some of these other and cover crops. So, but the, the, the recovery is, is very slight at this point, but at least it's starting. So what causes, how do we create or build organic carbon in the soil? We have the capacity factors. These are the drivers of the fundamental soil processes. And these include humification, you take uh, corn residue and the microbes and the earthworms and stuff, break it down to form humus. You have aggregation, which helps store the carbon. Translocation from the surface downward through earthworms and we have 60 some years of continuous no tillage at Worcester. And we can see how that pro carbon profile is increasing over time, going down. Never been tilled, but the earthworms are doing it for us. Uh, erosion, of course, you lose your carbon leaching and mineralization, the breaking down of the organic matter to CO2. Uh, these soil processes in turn are largely dictated by the management system. And that's what Aaron was talking about. He kept coming to management, management, management. That's what you can do. Some of these other things you can't really affect, but management can affect these different processes. So how does carbon, how do you build carbon in soil? There's really two ways, basic ways you can increase carbon. At, at, a, at a fundamental level, molecular level, I guess you could say more or less. One is through chemical protection. So here's starch and cellulose, some of the most commonly found compounds in nature. And you can see chemically, what would I do? There. Chemically, it's just sugars one after another, cellulose or starch. And so these are not very chemically protected. I'll say it that way. Because you can have one enzyme, it'll just start chewing at the end and the same enzyme keep chewing, 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 chewing. Break it down very quickly. That's not what I would call chemically protected, but it does break down and it will eventually form humus. But look at this. This is a theoretical humus molecule, one of the most complex molecules found in all of nature. A single enzyme starting to chew on that gets a little bit and all of a sudden finds a, a different type of chemical structure. I said, I don't know what to do with this. And so it stops and another enzyme has to be created by a bacteria and that chews a little bit farther and then another enzyme and and you can see humus is a great chemical preserver of soil organic matter, just because of its complexity. But we also have physical protection. Here's an aggregate. And they cut through the, through the aggregate. So this is a, a surface that was exposed. And you can see some cracks and macropores and that sort of thing. And so what they did is they cut this whole aggregate into all these different slices and they mapped it all out. 
and they, f they found this. So on the left is all these macropores and spaces and, and channels and that sort of thing. But only a few of those go through the aggregate or, or transverse. And so you can have organic carbon situated, in, and I wish, this, oh there, it's very faint. You could have organic carbon over here or over here, but it's not, there's no bacteria, there's nothing that can get to it. It's just physically protected because of the aggregate. And so when you till the soil and you break that aggregate apart, all of a sudden that carbon becomes exposed to air and bacteria and boom, it begins to decay very quickly. It's like stirring the fire in the fireplace. Introducing more carbon, more surface area of that wood to the flame. It's a slow burn when you degrade organic carbon in soil. And um, you have the chemical protection, but then what we call physical protection. Just because it's physically distant. You could have bacteria maybe some places. Maybe there are some bacteria. They're, but um, they're, they're relatively just inactive because they don't have exposure to uh, 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 oxygen or other types of nutrients they need. Uh, the type of carbon is also important and the amount of carbon. So we have done studies in Ohio and across the country and around the world. The more carbon you put into the soil, the more carbon you're going to store, right? That's a simple fact. Carbon in, carbon out, but the more carbon in, hopefully in the end you, you, you begin to store carbon, so cover crops, less tillage, those sorts of things. So this just shows carbon input, and over time, the more carbon in, the more organic matter occurs, is stored. And then the, the quality of the carbon. So if you have peat, which is a highly stabilized carbon source versus alfalfa, the alfalfa degrades very quickly. It doesn't store very much carbon. The peat will help you store more carbon in soil. Of course, we're not adding peat to our soils, but manure or straw, those sorts of things will help build carbon. So the quality of the carbon is also important, not only the amount. And then how do you determine the change in carbon? Uh, so the average rate is that dotted line, but if you just measure carbon change at the beginning and then extrapolate, you'll say, wow, in 10 years, I'm going to have a huge amount of carbon in my soil. Or if you measure the change uh, at the new equilibrium uh, over time, that average rate will, will change. So uh, you have to be careful about how you determine what your rate of change in carbon is, depending on the management change that you impose. Uh, these shows are some organic carbon uh, profiles and, and soil profiles at Worcester after 44 years. The organic carbon and the plow tillage versus the no-till profiles. This was done by a, a pedologist that helped me on this. You can see the change at Hoytville even more dramatic and one thing let me go back one thing you see in the no-till see that earthworm channel old root channel you don't see that where you till and you can see the same thing in here you can see some channels through there the amount of carbon the actual amount the pool when these plots were started in 1962 by Glover Triplett and Dave Van Dorn, um, the, the soil carbon is way on the left. There was some woods that were there uh, that hadn't been tilled, so we knew about what the long-term equilibrium carbon levels were. Uh, if they moved move that and changed some of that to a grassy system, that increased from the woods to a little bit more. But see how the no-till actually has increased the amount of carbon, or about the same as what it was in the wooded area, which is the soil was an alpha salt developed under a wooded area. So in 
At Worcester, we actually have done a very good job of recreating the carbon levels of what was there originally when the soil was first tilled. At Hoytville, you can see the original carbon on the left, the woods 11.85. Uh, we lost the carbon. It's been a little bit harder to build it back up in that soil, which is kind of counterintuitive because I thought the clay soils would build the carbon a little quicker, uh, but that's not what we have seen. Okay, so how do we build soil organic matter? Uh, we have our soil organic matter capacity factors, the landscape, the climate, texture. We then look at the fundamental soil processes that are affected by those capacity factors. Then we impose management system on our soil and we come up with the new equilibrium soil organic matter level. So let me show this in another way. Okay, so this is where we start. We're at actual level. That's what we measure, let's say, today. If we impose or introduce soil organic matter protecting measures, like controlling erosion, less tillage, uh, don't remove all the residues, we can move that towards what the potential value would be, which is on the top. But then uh, if we look at other input factors like the residue quality that we uh, have on our soils or in our crops, the net primary productivity, that's how much carbon is, is uh, captured through photosynthesis, photosynthesis in the crop, we can go to what's attainable with that management system. And then the potential would be if we met, try to improve all the different factors under the, the things like climate, landscape, and texture that we can change, but if we change everything else as much as possible, we could actually get to what I would call the potential amount of carbon in our soils. Okay, so Dave is going to come up here in a little bit, but I, I retired and uh, my wife said I get an F minus for retirement. <laughs> That's because I have a project in Ethiopia and uh, so whenever I talk, I say, well, you don't really need to pay me so much. Uh, just allow me to give a little bit of talk about my project in Africa. So if you want to learn more, uh, I'd be happy to come to your church or your house or whatever. But um, So train a farmer, feed a nation. We work in Africa. Uh, Bethel Agricultural Association is our organization name, and our model is train a farmer, feed a nation. These are my siblings. I come from a farm family of 13, and this is in 2017. This is all my siblings with their spouses. So from oldest at the front row, we go younger and younger, and then the second row until the very youngest is at the top right. And uh, my parents worked hard. We didn't have a lot of money growing up, but we had all what was needed, security and love. And my wife said, your family is all a bunch of Indian chiefs. There's no warriors, you know, we're all leaders. We just have come up, uh, I think, instilled in us. So I grew up in North Dakota and I saw those maps that Aaron showed. North Dakota seems to be cooler and a little bit wetter, but actually they're growing corn up there now. My brothers are growing 150 bushel per acre corn up in Manitoba, North Dakota border. Uh, I was going to be a, a medical doctor until my senior year. I went to Wheaton College in Illinois. I did a summer missions trip in Sudan, and it totally changed my whole life because I decided to go into agriculture because I thought I could do more good in agriculture than medicine, although I like doctors, <laughs> medical doctors. Um, I also met my wife. We were, she went to Guam, and I went to Africa. And then from Iowa State, I went to Ohio State University, well, from Wheaton College to Iowa State and Ohio State University where I had my career. Where's Ethiopia? It's right on the Horn of Africa. It's a strategic country because it borders the Islamic, primarily Islamic North and the Black African South. 
uh, although there's mixtures of that. Uh, it's the second most populous country in the world. It has the most animals of any country in the world, uh, any country in Africa, I should say. And uh, it's the headquarters of the African Union. So our project is located there about 70 miles from the capital. All of Africa comes to Addis, just like the uh, European Union and Brussels. So, so we have a great place to, to show and tell. Our vision is that Ethiopians and other Africans will experience a vibrant and thriving environmental and agricultural landscape that will lead to food security and a higher quality of life. I have nothing against giving food to people that need it, that are starving. But if that's all you do, four years later, you're going to do it again. And then you're going to do it again. You need to develop the potential of that country itself to feed its own people. So the mission to impart environmental and agricultural knowledge and skills that will enable Ethiopians and other Africans to protect their environment and practice sustainable agriculture. We do do some humanitarian aid. We go to, our project is located in a city called Wuliso. So we go to the city officials and say, who are the poorest of the poor? And then we've done two of these humanitarian food distributions. Uh, in 2019, we had a team from uh, Colorado come to do a master plan for us. And this was a very international team, Egypt, Ireland, Canada, US, South Africa, America. Engineers, architects came in, spent the whole week, did a master plan. So they came up with some drawings for us. And um, so we just are starting our first buildings. We asked the people, I think I have two more slides. We asked the people, what are your priorities for us? They gave us two priorities to begin with. One was to develop a demonstration farm so that we could show them better ways to produce. That makes sense, right? The second one caught me by surprise. They said, we want you to create an analytical chemistry lab. I think, you know, where did these farmers get that? Did somebody tell them? But the reason they said that, it says, we are farming blind. We don't know what the pH of our soil is. When we buy a bag of fertilizer, we don't know if we should put it on the whole field or part of the field. They wanted information. Information is so important. Knowledge is important uh, in management. So uh, our first project, we have a, a container that's going into Addis, uh, Ethiopia, right now with chemistry lab. And, but we had to fence our property, uh, 10 foot high fence. <laughs> uh, I think there were like 700 people worked on this. Yeah. And our immediate goal is to complete the buildings. So I'll be going there a, a month from today. I'll be leaving actually to go there and uh, help set up the lab. Uh, this is a farm family went to visit. Uh, progressive farmer, very progressive. This was in his home. And uh, these are some of the things that we're looking for this next year. Uh, creating a fish production pond, uh, poultry productions. These are some of the projects. This is our web page. And uh, just BethelAgriculture.org and our Facebook page. And that's it. Thank you so very, very much. And I think we'll reserve the questions until Dave, and then we'll uh, do a question and answer. Thank you. Well, uh, Warner's did a great job to talk about carbon, and I'm going to try to show you how we can grow carbon and uh, what we've done on our farm over the 50 years that we've been doing it. And, uh, but I think the big thing we have to remember is we have to eliminate disturbance if we're gonna maintain carbon. You know, uh, it's interesting, you know, Warren showed what it was in Ohio. Uh, I happen to be in Iowa and Illinois very many, lots of times. And uh, five years ago, I stopped at a place where they said the buffalo roamed across and had all kind of data. And, when the buffalo roamed across Iowa and Illinois, it was 14.5% organic matter. And this was nine years ago. 
when I was there, and I asked at Ohio, Iowa State University, what is the organic matter of their soils? And they said 4%. So in 150 years, they lost 10% of their organic matter. My question was to them, and I almost got thrown out, what will it be 100 years from now? Will it be zero? Will it be a desert? You know. So how can we maintain? So this is a picture of the farmstead. As you can see, we're, we're green. I call we're the oasis among the desert because all of our neighbors are still doing conventional tillage. And they qualify for carbon. We cannot qualify for carbon credits. They told us the only way we could do it was plow it and start over. And I said, absolutely not, you know. But I think we can do some things to keep improving the carbon that we're doing today on the farm. Uh, this is our operation. My son on the left, his wife, his, his daughter, uh, youngest boys uh, now working for Nationwide Insurance. Uh, Isaac's in the middle. He's our seed man, uh, works in our farm. Uh, takes care of all the mixing of our cover crop seeds and shipping and receiving. Uh, Chris is right there with the uh, green uh, striped shirt. He's uh, home taking care of the farm on the ag side of it. And uh, my uh, other grandson from uh, my daughter is there sometimes on the weekends uh, to help us. So we're operating about a thousand acres presently. Uh, I know this fall as soon as we finish shelling corn we're going to be down to 600 acres because the 400 acres we're farming will now have 555 homes on it in two years. You know, so that's what's happening in our world. You know, how do we begin? You know, we started no-tilling. First field was 1969. Question was, how long will David be doing it? Well, we're still doing it. Question was, it takes an awful lot of horsepower. Well, we had to show them it only takes four horsepower for a two-row planter, you know. Uh, the neat thing of it is the two guys walking behind was the, uh, the monitor telling us whether the seed was going in the ground or not, you know. So we've come a long way, guys. You know, in the last 15 years, there's not been a piece of equipment that you could not do no-till or use in cover crop situations. So that's the greatest thing that's happened, you know. This was our first no-till drill. Just think how far we've come, people, you know. And here's what we have today, technology today. And how wonderful it is to know that we have this kind of opportunity today to keep our carbon, keep our soils in place, you know. And we're going to have to learn to infiltrate the water and make our carbon footprint a lot smaller, you know. Uh, yes, we can do it. There's the corn behind it next year's cover crop in front of it with only 50 pounds of nitrogen. Why do I say that? 76% of the atmosphere is nitrogen. Why aren't we capturing some of it? Why aren't we figuring out how to utilize that instead of paying a dollar a pound for it at the retail sales place, you know? As we capture the nitrogen, we can also keep it in the soil, you know? We begin by capturing nitrogen early in the years with cover crops. With winter peas, worked really well. We believe in a three-year rotation where corn, followed by rye, followed by soybeans, followed by small grain, followed by a large cover crop mix afterwards. And we have taken our soils from a half percent organic matter in 1971 to an 8.3 organic matter today. And it took us 55 years to do it. Guess what we know today? As we learn to change from single species crops, which we didn't know we could do for 25 years, because we didn't know we could have a cow have baby pigs, you know, we didn't know that. We can't do that yet, but yet we can put 10 different species in the field and make it work better. And that's when we turned the, the tables for us. We started using multiple species. We could change the organic matter we put in the soil, you know, we'll talk more about that. What we look at is root systems, you know. Our soils are just like our bodies, you know. Our bodies have microbes, protozoa, things like that. Most soils today, this conventional, are highly bacteria, highly bacteria. That's why they need nutrients being bought. They have no protozoa, they have no nematodes, they have no arthropods. Because you work the ground and you wear them out and they leave, you know. 
How many times would you build, rebuild your house if you had a thunderstorm, a rainfall event, a wind event, a storm, a fire event in one year? And that's what you do when you have tillage. You destroy the house they live in. So we lose all, we lose all the good things that's in the soil. Harry Vetch, you know, I can, I'm just going to go real fast through these because you know what we're trying to do. We're talking about what we can use, you know. How can we use? These are things we found out. And look at this, guys and gals. You know, we can capture nitrogen. These are all nitrogen-fixing things, you know. So we can capture a lot of nitrogen if you want to utilize what's available, you know. But also, remember, you want to put enough cereals or enough carbon features to go with these so that you don't change the balance of the nitrogen or the calcium and all that stuff, you know, the ratio. Uh, and just another chart that just shows you uh, this was results from a university, ours was from our farm, you know, and this is what we plan into in the spring. You know, we have infiltration. On our farm today, we can infiltrate a rainfall event at six inches an hour. Just imagine what you could do if you could save six inches of water every time it rained. You know. In, 60, in uh, 96, I began working with tillage radishes. And don't do this, guys. Don't find something that works really well and go brag about it. Keep your mouth shut. Because if you take it to the soil and water office and they take your picture, then you have to do what I'm doing today. You know. So, you know. But these things really work. There are, there are storage tanks. They work really well. They hold a lot of nutrients. We figured out how to do it with a planter using two species. A big change in our production on crop production plus what we're putting in the soil. You know. We found out that the reddish stole the nitrogen away from the winter pea. So the winter pea put more nodules on. Increased nitrogen production from those two crops immensely. You know. They also act like a tillage tool for us. We haven't tilled since 1970. We don't own any tillage tools. Our farm consists of a corn planter, a drill, a sprayer, and a combine. Lots of wagons, because we don't have semis, and two or three big tractors to pull them big wagons, you know. But we don't have any tillage tools. Uh, Dr. Lepeak Ism did the work. This is a five-year study. This in addition to what he found after we took the soil samples, after we planted these peas and radishes. This was in addition to what we found in the field. If we can do that on our farm, we don't need to buy too much fertilizer from, the, from a retail store, you know. I believe in rotations. We've got to have this carbon there to help protect the soil, you know. It really works well for us. And this is what we're after today. We want species that does everything for us. We want things that flower that brings beneficial insects. As we get things that flower, we can cut down on the insecticide and fungicide the seed corn treatment we need. We've been seven years with naked seeds. We've not used a fungicide or insecticide for 16 years. You know. If you want to build carbon, look at your big grasses. Do them after wheat. If we can grow 24,000 pounds of green biomass on my farm, Give Dave Brandt one percent organic matter six inches deep in the soil that one year. One percent organic matter changing in your soil means you have additional 60 pounds of nitrogen available next year's crop. You can hold 27,560 gallon more water. Imagine what that means in August when it hadn't rained for three weeks. You know. We have to infiltrate it to keep it. We need to cover crops there to do that, you know. Some years it works great, you know. Green farming has been fun. It takes a lot more management, 
But if you have a good year like this, it's easy. You just use a planter, you roll it down, no herbicides, no fertilizer, and you get a corn yield. You know, or a bean yield. Next year, I'm totally different. Management strategy is totally different in 18. Why? Cover crop didn't get big enough. We couldn't roll it. It didn't get big enough to set enough nitrogen in the soil. So we had to buy some. We had to put some chemical on. You have to be flexible. You know? Anybody can do corn and beans conventional if you're going to put all the fertilizer, all the nitrogen, all the fungicides, all the insecticides, and all you got to worry about if it rains. And some guys don't even worry about that because they got irrigation. You know, there's what it looks like with a planter. Grandson came back to the farm five years ago from the city, and we got him going. And we went out to lunch one day, and he came back and he said, "Grandpa, he says everybody's got a green planter," and he said, "You got a red one." And I says, "Well, Chris, if we went to lunch and come back and we had a green planter and a cover crop grew, we couldn't find it. You know, <laughs> couldn't find it." Just imagine having this much green biomass on the surface, protecting the soil, holding a raindrop back as it comes. Look how much fun this is, you know? There's no dust on the planter. You know, look how clean the equipment looks. Fuel consumption is down by 17% versus conventional tillage, you know? Combine rolls easier when you're shelling corn or cutting beans. Another time to save a few bucks in the fuel. You know. As you can see, if you look over the top of the cab, you can see the marker on our work. Grandson now has been on the farm for five years. Guess what? That tractor has guidance because he couldn't figure out how to go without markers. You know. I didn't have a problem. I just always planted. Got up on top of the cab, looked around. If all the rye was leaning over, I did a pretty good job. You know, if it wasn't, you went and made it lean over, you know. Here's what we're talking about. You know, we talked about how we can change climate. I think I can change the climate if everybody had cover crop in a large enough area. Why do I say that? I used to be 17 miles from the city of Columbus. Now we're seven. Guess what's happened in our farm the last two years? Our normal rainfall till two years ago was 35 inches a year. The last two years has been 74 inches. Guess what? It rains a mile in front of my house, rains two miles east of us and quits. The last two years, three miles east of us, they've had dry weather and had problems in August because the corn dries up. I think the city of Columbus made a mini climate in the speck of us. If they can do it, I can do it by keeping the soil 20 degrees cooler, having a better chance to grow the crops, and look at the conventional field. The soil is cracked open, there's crust on it, and only infiltrating a quarter inch an hour when it rains. Warren already told us, or we was told this morning with the first speaker, that we're getting larger rainfall events. One inch, two inch, three inches in a 20 minutes. We had a five and a half inch rainfall event in an hour on our farm this year. We have, a flume, we have two flumes. We have one on the tile, we have one on a surface water inlet. A 45 acre surface water inlet got no water through the flume on a five and a half inch rainfall event in two hours. Zero water. What does that mean? We're infiltrating it, hanging on to it. You know. Uh, but I pushed the wrong button. There's what we can get. To me, this means this we're doing it right. We got armor on the soil. We got a crop coming through it, and it looks dark green. You know, we're not pushing 300 bushel corn. We're pushing 175 to, to, 290, or to 190, but we're happy with that. We got lots of return on our investment, you know. Cost-wise, here we are. 
All I'm going to tell you is this is 2023. Just multiply those figures times three. Doesn't matter whether it was 18 or 2023. We're still going to make some money. You know. The input cost was $334. It took uh, 107 bushel of corn to break even. We made 192. Not too bad. You take that times three now, you know that's, uh, that's 600, 700, 800 dollars an acre return on investment. Pretty decent. How do we know what we do? We've learned to use tools of the trade. Spad meter. What we're doing is look at chlorophyll in the leaf. To me, it's a direct correlation to how much nitrogen is in the soil. Now on Dave Brand's farm, if that meter says 42 parts per million, we know we got enough nitrogen. If it says 41 or 40, 39, we're going to put some on. We're not going to stress that corner to see if it'll work. We're going to put a little bit on, make it work, you know. Other tools we can use. This is a uh, chlorophyll stick. You put it, or a spad meter like, stick it in the ground. It collects, it actually tells you how much carbon dioxide is leaving the soil. Another great correlation of how my microbes are eating the bacteria, giving off enzymes or nutrients for the corn crop, and it costs seven bucks. And this is just a moment in time, guys, because tomorrow it'll be different, you know. <clears throat> but what we're trying to prove is, as we do better, as we keep the soil covered, we do climate smart agriculture, if you want to call it that, you know, back in the, in the 70s, it was called trash farming. In the 80s, we were the ugly farmer. In the 90s, we were sustainable. You know, now we're going to be climate smart. But anyhow, look at the protein without fertilizer in our corn. We add fertilizer, we lose about a, half, a point. We go full rate of my agronomy guy, and I pay my agronomist to talk to me. We have a lot of fun together. I pay him five bucks an acre, not seven. He's not worth seven to me, you know. And I don't listen to him, but I just have a lot of fun, you know. But he keeps telling me we got to keep more, putting more fertilizer on. David, you know, he's selling it, so he wants to make some money too. And I said, well, let's try it. So here's what happened. We went full rate, which was he would recommend for a conventional farmer, and we lost a whole point and a half of protein. We go to our conventional neighbors. They're 5% corn. If you're a livestock person, which one of these corns do you want to feed? You know? And Dr. Warren already told us about how healthy the soil could be. So if we have healthier corn that we're feeding to livestock that are healthier, guess what? We're going to become healthier human beings. So that's how it relates back to human health. You know. Well, this is some plot work we did. Just to give you an idea. Look at the protein readings of some of this corn. Out of the field, 9.3. There's well, there's a variety of spectrums of 11% protein. All the way down to six, some sevens, you know. And the only difference here is variety. You know? It's in the same cover crop field, treated the same. So we have to learn what's out there. There's not a company today selling you seed corn that's growing and telling you what it's going to do in a cover crop situation. You know? And I think you have to try some of this on your own. Because you all have ways to check. If you don't have, an, if you don't have a yield monitor, you got a wind in the cab that looks in the grain bin, just put a mark on it and go to the next variety and see what happens. It may be significantly less or significantly better. So, but today we have yield monitors to tell us what's going on. The big thing I wanted to show you in this, and this is too busy, I shouldn't even show this to you, but if we go up here in 2018 and we look at these two varieties right here, 111 day varieties from the same company, one's a racehorse, one's a workhorse. One variety returned $57 an acre, then return two hundred and twenty nine dollars. If I didn't do the plot, I wouldn't know that. 
But guess what? You sure ain't going to buy that 111-day corn that only made you $57 an acre. With another one right beside it, the same day length, the only difference was 12 rows apart in the field, and you made another 200 bucks or 170 bucks an acre, why not? You know? Some other things we play with, you know? We got a split low planter. A lot of guys has got them. We plant corn, we plant soybeans, we plant small grains, we plant our cover crop with it. Gets used about six months out of the year instead of three days. Yes, it wears out. We've never wore out the frame. You know, we wore out a lot of bolts and a lot of displays. We never wore out the frame. So we decided, well, you know, let's try some soybeans between corn. Guess what? Soybeans are nitrogen fixer. Put about 50 or 60 pounds of benefit to the corn crop. Why not? You know? Come on. There it is a little later on. You know? Didn't do too bad. Here was the plot information, working with the BOAG class. Soybeans in the top with no nitrogen, two or four different varieties, about 175, 180 bushels per acre average. Moved down, planted the same varieties, same field, put on 140 units of nitrogen, and look at the yield loss. I don't know why, haven't figured out why, other than maybe we got too much salt from the urea. I don't know. Doing a lot of other things. Planting wheat in two 15 inch or two seven inch rows, skipping two seven inch rows, coming back in the spring, planting soybeans. So there they are. That would be our 15 inch planter. That's 15 inch wheat. Come back in the spring, set the draw bar over as far as it go to the right or left. Drive on the same wheel tracks, plant the soybeans. 62 bushel wheat, 54 bushel beans. Do the math. Do the math. Other things we're trying. Everybody around us does double crop beans. Probably average 25, 30 bushel overall year averages. Last year they were better. We had guys bringing about 45 bushel double crop beans. They're making some money, but they're also spending a lot of money for fertilizer the next year. So this is a 10-way species we put in, and we put grain sorghum. The only thing David forgot, I put winter peas with that, and the winter peas crawled up on the grain sorghum. So when we harvested the grain sorghum, we was getting a hell of a lot of green peas too, you know. But we ended up with 950 pounds of grain sorghum, had about 10,000 bushel of it. Grant says, Grandpa, what are we going to do with this? And he says, there's no market. I says, get on the internet. Somewhere he found a bird feed industry in Toledo that paid 70 cents a pound. 700 pounds the acre, 70 cents a pound. Just as good as double crop bean and still had a cover crop protecting my soils. Still doing what I wanted to do, you know. Some years it works, some years frost too soon, you know. Been well known. This happened to be a, uh, all these are agronomists, and the uh, fellow beside me in the blue shirt was the professor from Beijing University, trying to show them how they can be more productive, teaching them how to make their crops better to feed their people. You know, like Warren says, you teach them how to grow things, you teach a man how to fish, he can feed himself. You give him fish and he'll go way hungry in two days. You know. We need to take the time to tell people what we're doing. Don't be afraid to tell your neighbor or your, your uh, house dweller beside you what you're doing to make their food source better. You know. Talked about beneficial insects. Here's what we love. We used to not find these. We didn't find them until we dropped out the neonics on the soybeans and the, and the corn. And this is called a crabbit beetle. He'll eat 10 slugs a night. 
in the morning before he gets up, the sun comes up, I found three foxtail seeds and a giant ragweed seed in him to clean out his gullet. Guess what? I got a thing that's eating insects. I also got a thing to help me with weed control. You come to our farm, I'll give you a shovel, and you can find five to six in every shovel full. It's like finding earthworms. You know. That's what it looks like at planting time. You can plant brown. You know, the first speaker talked about the weather. Guess what? Our weatherman in Fairfield County, Ohio, is never right. It's not going to rain for three weeks, David. Drum man says, burn off all your cover crops because you're going to dry the ground out. Got them all brown. Rain's an inch and a half. Can't get the soil dried out. Sunlight don't get down there. No wind gets down there. No tile. That's wet. Guess what? There's a way to do it, guys. Gals, plant her green. For David, the bigger it is, the bigger it is, the more biomass we have, the more chance we have more nutrients to, to replace in the soil, more chances to increase the yield, roll her down. It works really well. I stole this from Rick Clark. But what I wanted to show you there, if you look, 12-inch uh, rye before we planted the beans was 2,000 pounds of biomass. And you can read the nitrogen and the phosphorus. If you look at the 24-inch level or 28-inch level, which is knee-high, that's not waist-high, that's knee-high, because I haven't gotten convinced he can plant it at five foot tall yet, but he's coming. But he had 6,800 pounds of biomass on the surface. The real clincher of this whole slide is looking at two months later. Two months later, he run a sample of that biomass. And look at the phosphorus and the potash and the biomass on the surface. I'm saying every time we get a rainfall event and it goes through this cover crop, we make something called compost tea. And what compost tea is, it's taking the nutrients from that cover crop and taking it down and feeding the root system of our other crop that's there. And that's from Dave Brandt University, not anybody else. You know. But we see response every time it rains on our crops. You know, my lovely wife, we were married 55 years before her cancer took her, but she loved to roll. I mean, she loved it. Six mile an hour, 30, 20, 30 foot roller. The only thing she always got aggravated with me, she'd do all that all in the morning. We go in for lunch, and the first thing you never ask her when you go in is, what's for lunch? You know, because she can let you know she'd been out all morning. But look how it lays down the residue. Makes a carpet on the soil. Retards that raindrop. Keeps the soil from blowing away. I saw in the Texas panhandle through Oklahoma and up through Kansas last week on the news, they showed that there was a dust storm that put three foot of silt on farmers' equipment. Three foot of silt. Almost bad as in the 30s. You know, why haven't we learned our lesson? Why don't we find a plant that will grow there? You know, there's our soybeans coming. Here's our results. You know. Here's our results. No herbicides. Roll the rye. Works well. Cost, same thing as corn. Don't need to belabor it. Not telling I'm good, that's just what we got in it. We do a lot of work test plots, you saw that. Information, this is different things we try to make sure we're doing it right. Add a lot of nitrogen, see what happens. Add less. See what happens. That's a three or four year study. You know, well that was data from five different, four different fields that year that we collected. Uh, again, that's the variety trial. You've seen that. How can we get it done? There's all kinds of ways. You know, you can have an expensive piece of equipment like this that does a nice job. Probably, I'm going to tell you, 85, 90% successful to get a stand. You know, works really well. 
It's slow. But you can get it done. It's not that slow, but you know, an airplane's fast. You know, I think this be the way of the future. If we understand our herbicides that we're using, where we can go out and we can blow urea and cover crop together. We're actually doing two things here. We're side dressing the corn and throwing on a cover crop at the same time. You know, here's what it looks like. It's coming. This was uh, rye and radishes and, and probably balanced clover blown on. Uh, this was a field of beans we took off. You could barely see the hairy vegetables and the crimson clover. This is two weeks later. 100% ground cover in two weeks after soybean harvest. We can do it. It's just management stills that we have to have. When you really get lazy like I am, and you get behind, we just throw all the rye in a fertilizer spreader, set the gate so when the chain moves across it, you get a little few sparks. That'll put on 60 pounds, run seven mile an hour, get a hell of a lot done in a day. And yes, it will grow. Not as good as if it was at the drill, you know, but you at least got to cover out there. That's how important cover is to David. We got to get it out there. You know, I want to show you this picture because I wanted to show you what we're trying to do. That's our woodlot in the top upper corner of the picture. Look at the size of the trees. They're not all the same height. They're not all the same kind. If you look at our cover crop with a 10-way blend in it, we got tall things. We got medium things. We got things that's just com coming out of the ground like clovers and stuff. We're mimicking Mother Nature. You know, the woodlot's never been fertilized, and it's 6% organic matter. The field I'm standing in now with the cover crops is 8. Warren, I never thought we'd pass our woodlot. I never did. You know, I don't know what the limit is, you know. Can we become a prairie soil? Maybe we can take a woodlot soil and make it a prairie soil if we treat it right. Right, right. Not like, not like a prairie soil. And then we learned a lesson. You know, some, some of our neighbors have livestock. They call me and says, we're out of feed. We'd like to borrow some of your feed. Well, the rule is you leave half, you know. These, these were 500-pound stalkers. We moved them every two days. Gained 4.5 pound a day. They left the farm weighing 970 pounds. They all went to the market as grass-fed cattle. Sold them for 450 a pound. You know, guess what? Pretty nice return. You know. Do they like it? They really do. The first time you do that, you have to make a path because they will not walk in the cover crop field. When it's taller than they are. Once they've learned how to do it, and they see you come the second day, they're willing to go. You know, you don't have to ever do that again. We sell poor man crop rollers, two before an angle iron, two bungee cords. It'll work real well. You know, we also have this for backyard gardeners that want, don't want to work any harder than I do. You can see I don't use anything that don't have a motor, you know. And there's Rick Clark, a 74-foot roller. I saw that field. Guess what, guys and gals? The corn was four inches tall when he was rolling that cover crop. And all he wanted to do was suppress it enough to get the corn to come up through it because he's an organic farmer. Not that he's got the right answers. Some years it works, some years it fails, and he's going to tell, he'll tell you that right if he was standing here just like I would, but that's how he does it, you know. Warren, look at this. Look at this, Warren. You talked about Kershockton, you know. This was yellow clay soils in 71, guys. Cardington yellow clay soils. Look at the very bottom of the picture, if you can see it. 
That's all the yellow left. My goal in five more years is to have 49 inches of dark colored soil on our farm. All done by earthworms and roots. We're now setting at 27 inches, 8% organic matter, Warren, at the 24 inch level. There's what we started with on the left, or on the right. This is what we have today. We can do it. It takes management, it takes time, it takes understanding, and it takes failure. We've probably had a thousand failures and six successes, you know. But you have to learn to manage around those. You have to be determined, just like you're determined on your conventional stuff, you know. Abyssal mycorrhiza. I think that's the right term. I'm just a farmer, so there may be another technical name for that. But that's mycorrhiza that you can see with your eyes, and look at it around the roots. That's what's feeding our crops. It's not the little pellet of fertilizer that you buy at the store. No, that has to be broken down by the soil to make that plant utilize. This we have on our farm. We talked about clean water. Clean water on the left, neighbors on the right, or vice versa, sorry. Those are neighbors, 80 acre field, two and a half inch rainfall event in May. Same day, he was across the road, this is ours, 80 acres above it. Look at the difference in the flow, guys. You know, do you want that? Do you want your organic matter leaving? Three and a half ton of soil loss in that event. He lost $62 worth of nutrients per acre just by soil loss. As of yet, I've not found a university that will tell me what a ton of soil loses. But that's what I figure we've lost off of his farm. We look at what's going on. Water's fairly clean, maybe just a little cloudy, you know. We were fortunate enough that our farm was where they kicked off the soil health movement. This happens to be the Chief White. That's uh, where he came to learn and do things. And we have really worked hard with NRCS. We do lots of innovative things. I have 27 landlords, less than five acres. So we're now doing a lot of farm to table things. So this is my precision planter. You can see it's got a fluted colder, it's got a seed colder, it's got a press wheel. There's a red mark on that press wheel. The seed box is that 55 gallon bucket between the man's legs of the funnel. When he sees the red mark, he throws two seeds in the plot. Down the funnel it goes. He's bitching at 10 o'clock, so I give him air conditioning. You know, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, it's too hard, it won't go in the ground, so we transfer the 200 pound weight and put the stupid in the bib there on the seat with 400 pounds, and we're off and running. Can't be more precision than that, guys. There's the results. Guess what? Five acres of pumpkins is worth 100 acres of corn to Dave Brandt. Because all I got to do is set on a bale of straw with an old pair of blue jeans on and watch people pick them and collect the money out of their trunk. It used to be money, now it's plastic. You know, so. This is our new adventure. This was this spring or this summer. We had a young man, he's about 23 years old, just starting farming. He's, he's about 30 miles away. He called me, he says, I got 200 cows, I got 270 ewes. He says, we're out of feed. Can I rent your cover crops? I said, don't have any fence. He said, I'll build a fence. So we put 270 ewes on two acres. We moved them every other day. I didn't, he did. Interesting thing, we put rams with them after... They were there for 45 days. He took them home, pregnant tested all of them, 100% had lambs in them. Best he's ever had. And he ate the cover crop. You know, fun things to do. A little bit about gardening. We like rye and hairy vetch. Roll it down, stick the tomato in there, and you're off and running. 20 pounds more tomatoes for every plant. 
you know, right cover versus plastic. Versus plastic. We're in the milling business, so now we're milling corn and soy or wheat and doing five and 10 and 15 pound sales over the internet. So we'll take, Warren and I will take any kind of questions you got for the time left.